We're back with the Arsenal news as Bayern Munich could be in a little bit of bother next week. We've got Champions League roundups and some more transfer news to discuss as well. This is the Arsenal News Show. Hello and welcome to the Guna Talk. Back again with you guys for another episode of what is the Arsenal News Show. Joining you every single morning at 8am UK time. Thank you as always for joining me and making this a part of your morning routines. It is incredibly appreciated. If you've not yet dropped a like on the video, please do. We're trying to get to 1k every single day and we've been incredibly successful in doing so so thank you for your kind support on the channel as always it is so humbling and uh, let's jump into the chat and say good morning to our people who are joining us live around the world paul good morning to you to clincy to guna 76 to ryan good morning to Stephen, and um i'm gonna go with nochebe uh it's the best i can do i'm afraid uh pikahoo jackie nate harrison uh amira kaiser uh we've got rich uh martin we've got black shine darren um, Jose, Ian, Paul, Damian, Rowan, Carlton, uh, Amesy, Matt G, Babatundi, Martin, Robert, Shari, Trevor, uh, Morgie, Stevie. Thank you so much to all of you for tuning in. It is incredibly appreciated. I hope you've had a fantastic week so far. And uh, yeah, I hope that uh, the rest of your week, the short time that remains left of it, is also very prosperous because we're closing in on a return to Premier League football. Of course, Arsenal will be in action on the weekend against Aston Villa. Uh, a very important game, one which sits between these two fixtures against Bayern Munich. And we can't afford to let ourselves get distracted. We need to make sure that we have got full focus still on the Premier League because there is a big, big job to do. But there's plenty of news for us to discuss. We'll go to part two and your questions in a little bit. But we kick off with last night's Champions League games and a roundup of all the fixtures um, from the quarterfinals of the competition. Uh, Arsenal against Bayern Munich, as we know, because we were there, we were watching, drew 2-2. And in the other game on Tuesday night, as we mentioned yesterday, Real Madrid drawing 3-3 with Manchester City. Now, last night saw some fixtures which didn't end in a draw, but only one goal could separate both sides. Atletico Madrid taking a two-goal lead. Rodrigo de Paul giving them a very early lead. Um, but at the end of the game, uh, we saw Sebastian Haller uh, score to bring the tie very much back into contention and for Dortmund to have a better chance of potentially getting a result in the uh, in the Signal and Duna Park in just a week's time. Then we've got the PSG Barcelona game, which was very entertaining indeed. Barcelona fielding some incredibly young players and coming through on top despite the challenge in front of them. Massive away win for them, 3-2 in the Parc de Plants and uh, Kylian Mbappe again facing the prospect of leaving the Champions League, having never won the competition with PSG prior to his expected summer departure. But huge job for uh, PSG to do in Barcelona. We know that there is history between these two sides in this competition. Remember the Unai Emery ridiculous comeback. Uh, well, PSG are going to need a comeback of their own this time around in the camp now. Moving forwards, though, and into some Injury news on Bayern Munich's side. It's been confirmed that Gnabry did indeed suffer a hamstring injury. Uh, there is the potential, of course, that he will therefore miss the game with Arsenal next week. Uh, they've already received news that Alfonso Davies, of course, will not be involved either, which is the double blow that Bayern have now suffered their entire left side of Gnabry and Davies missing for them as they face Arsenal at the Allianz Arena next week, meaning that it's likely that Rafa Guerrero will come in. I expect Kingsley Coman will also come in to that left flank. And Musiala could play there, I guess, with Thomas Muller going into the number 10 role. But there is other options. There's plenty of options for Bayern um, because they've got so many attacking talents. But I'd much rather that Saka was going up against Guerrero. I know that Alfonso Davies didn't have the most amazing of games at the Emirates. Yet, that said... I think Guerrero against Saka is a much more favourable matchup from an Arsenal point of view. Moving forwards, Arsenal against Manchester United has been rescheduled. Uh, it's been confirmed that Manchester United, sorry, Arsenal's visit to Manchester United, which was set to take place um, on Saturday, the uh, May 11th game, is now set to take place on Sunday, uh, May, May 12th at 4 30 
p.m. Um, so there is a slight change to the fixture scheduling there, and uh, they will aim to be going there, hopefully, with a chance of still keeping the title race alive going into the final week. Who knows? Could they go to Old Trafford with a chance of winning the title? That would be quite incredible. The final game of the season, of course, is against Everton the following Sunday at 4 p.m. All games on the final game of the season, of course, taking place at the same time. Um, 4 p.m. on that Sunday, May 19th. So, yes, a fixture sch uh, scheduling change for you. I think this is, is slightly good for us that it's on the Sunday. It gives us more break rest. If Arsenal were to, of course, um, progress through to the later rounds of the Champions League, that final week of uh, the league is completely free for Arsenal right now, unless there's any crazy fixture scheduling changes. Um, but that final week of Arsenal is free, so it gives Arsenal some more rest, which I think is is positive. Uh, at the end of the day. Um, moving into transfers, and according to Florian Pletterberg uh, of Sky Germany, uh, Brentford are expected to drop their asking price for Ivan Tony. Uh, now, we were talking of £100 million figures um, that were, of course, in the, in the sphere of the January transfer window, you may remember. Well, now things have changed quite considerably. Uh, according to Florian Pletterberg, uh, Brentford will drop their asking price to around 30 to 40 million pounds, which is more than more than half the original asking price from January. I think that probably gives you an indication about where the valuation of Tony is in the wider scheme of football. I think perhaps this is an indication about the interest that's perhaps being shown in Tony right now. It is a much, much fairer price. And I've seen some people tweet in response to this news yesterday they were like well this changes everything surely Arsenal have to go into the market and go and sign it for 30 to 40 million pounds it's absolutely a no-brainer it's not a no-brainer it is not a no-brainer whatsoever because <laughs> this shows and is the indication that he is not the signing that Arsenal would ever want and need to go for we shouldn't be going for a player because they're cheaper now Arsenal should be going out into the market trying to get the best potential option they could possibly get and Tony has never been that player. Never, ever has he been that player. So just because his price dropped suddenly and there's suggestions that he might be going for 30 to 40 million pounds instead of 100 million, it doesn't mean that Arsenal should go in the market and go and get him. Not so, not whatsoever. He's not good enough to be Arsenal's centre forward or for us to invest in him as a profile over the next few years or so. There is still opportunities for Arsenal to get younger options in the market. And from my understanding from people, uh, from speaking to people at the club, certainly the aim is for Arsenal to sign a younger profile striker anyway. So I really don't think that Tony would be on the market for Arsenal this summer anyway. Things have seemingly moved on. Now, but the final story that I want to discuss with you today comes from Odia, uh, which is a Brazilian outfit. I, I've got to say, I had to triple, triple check that this wasn't kind of a bit of a joke because when you see a source which is called Odia. Um, <laughs> I thought there was something there, but nope, genuinely, the website is Odia. Um, being reported and aggregated yesterday, so I wanted to highlight it. Brazilian media suggesting that Arsenal are said to be interested in Brazilian international and Wolves midfielder Joao Gomez. Uh, he has been, you know, a, quite an impressive figure, I think, in that um, team. He's obviously the replacement for Ruben Neves, who Arsenal were, of course, previously interested in as well. He's had a decent season since arriving from Flamengo uh, in January of last year. He had those six months at the end of last season. He's really acclimatised the league now. He's had 18 months uh, involved in it also to kind of uh, to kind of adjust. His numbers, well, they do need to improve. I think they're not startlingly good. Defensively, though, he looks quite good. 99 percentile for tackles, according to FB Ref, uh, 4.28 tackles per 90. 94th percentile for blocks as well, 1.92 per 90. But the others are in the 40s and 50s and even the 30s across the passes and the, the, the attacking kind of contributions. Maybe they would change if he was to move to Arsenal. But he's a, he's a talented player. There's definitely, I've been impressed by him um, when I watch him in games. But the numbers aren't necessarily reflecting um, Joao Gomez's potential talent. Maybe there is more that needs to be seen before Arsenal commit to a potential investment in him. But he is said to be one of the players that are on Arsenal's radar. So keep an eye on Joao Gomez because he's certainly a talented player. But uh, price-wise, don't really know how much Wolves would be looking to charge. Now, you aren't being asked to pay too much to get involved in what is quite a special competition. Uh, it is the final couple of days that this competition is indeed available for you to get involved because it is the ultimate Euro 2024 match day experience that you could win courtesy of football prizes. Link down in the description. Uh, in the biggest competition ever, 
that they have done. It is your chance to win the ultimate 2024 Euro experience where you can get two tickets on the private jet from the Manchester private terminal at Col- uh, to Cologne on the 24th of June. Two nights accommodation in Cologne. Tickets to England against Slovenia at Euro 24. That's two of those. And two tickets back on the private jet from the Cologne private terminal to Manchester on June 26th. Now, I can tell you that there is only two days, actually one day and 11 hours at the time of recording left in this competition. And only 11-ish thousand, 11,000 tickets around that figure have been sold, which means that 38,000 38, tickets are still available. And if that means you buy a ticket, you're getting an incredibly good odds for this, for what the competition is. So, And they're only 195. You can buy um, multiple tickets if you would choose to. And there is a lot of instant win prizes as well involved, where you can get the information of that on the website as well. Really best of luck to anyone who wants to do this. It is a UK-only competition, as Football Prizes is. I had a couple of people message me saying, why is it UK-only? That's not down to me, by the way. I, <laughs> it's, it's nothing to do with me. I think it's to do with like um, postage and delivery with, with the other prizes. But Football Prizes is a UK-only um, thing. So uh, sorry about that. If you've got friends in the UK that can buy you a ticket, then, of course, maybe get involved there. But all the information is down in the description. So, um, And, of course, we'll be talking about this one more time tomorrow. But there's very, you know, it's great odds for what is an incredible prize. Right, let's go to part two and your questions right after this. Okay, part two is here, which means it's the part of the show in which we jump into the chat box and tackle some of your questions. There was a comment earlier on that I wanted to kind of just highlight because it does it's here kieran here says are we live on youtube right now it isn't showing for me on twitter um and i can see that there's just under a hundred of you listening on twitter as i always say it's great that we got twitter's really pushing us but if you hop over to youtube you can actually join in with the chat box far easier and it's a lot smoother so i recommend if you are a twitter watcher or an x watcher um an x watcher you can get you get done for that, can't you? <laughs> I don't want to be stalking your ex. Uh, but if you are a watcher on X, the platform, uh, do drop over to uh, to YouTube. And Kieran has indeed done that. There you go. Kieran joins us now on YouTube. So there you go. Um, Gage says, what did you make of Kimmich? Seemed to be so calm defending with the ball. Could be a great addition. I actually wrote an entire article about this yesterday. I don't know if you saw this tweeted um, yesterday, but uh, yeah, I wrote a piece about how I thought the performance of Kimmich in this game was a massive indication of, of everything that we've come to expect from him and, and why we should probably be looking to sign him. Um, Rin says, uh, I'd put money on Gabriel stuffing Tony in a trash bin if he ended up in that dressing room. Goodness me. Uh, Damien says, I saw 40 million this morning and I thought I'd misread it. That's quite the climb down. But yes, I agree. Tony is still a no, uh, absolutely. Wayne says, hi, Tom. I saw your Eric Dyer penalty question. All I can say is spiky. Fair play to you. Yeah, you can go and watch my chat with Eric Dyer after the game against Bayern. I asked him what he thought of the Saka penalty and he immediately switched tact to the Gabriel penalty. For context, I had not seen the Gabriel incident when I asked Eric Dyer the question. None of us in the mix zone had seen it or knew what he was talking about. So when I said to him, and you, as I say, you can watch it on the Haters website. It's the interview where it dies. About two minutes into the video, you get to my question. But I said to him, like, "What? you were very close to the sack of penalty incident. What did you think about it? And he said, well, I think we should have had a penalty. And I was like, really? What, what for? Because I didn't have a clue what he was on about. Neither did any of us. And he was like, well, what do you think? And I was like, you tell me. I don't know. I don't know. So he explained it. And, you know, in retrospect, as I mentioned on yesterday's show, I think he's got a very good argument. I've seen. I've, I've reflected on the Gabriel penalty one a bit more, um, and I think that I think I I have a lot of sympathy with the, the the side of the argument that suggests the spirit of the game, context. Do we want to see decisions given for that type of thing? And I think the argument is is really strong in that side of things. I think it's a really good argument. I think it was CBS I was watching and the refereeing analytics uh, that were given on there. Jamie Carragher, I think, um, quote tweeted it. Uh, yesterday because it was a really good explanation actually to be fair of of why it wasn't given in the game and the context surrounding it also uh, the explanation came from uh, Christina Uncle who I think is a really good refereeing um, kind of pundit on CBS as well uh, for every time I've seen a clip of her I mean you obviously those that have access to CBS a lot more may have a different opinion if you've seen more but from what I've seen of her I think she's been really good from a refereeing standpoint but she had a really good um 
she was uh, talking about to I think it was Nigel Rio Coca, and um, he was saying like two guys every right to be annoyed. And yesterday's show, you know, I was very much of the mindset that I think that we got very fortunate, and I still to a degree think that we we have got you know slightly fortunate, and that we're fortunate that the referee took the angle of it being in the spirit of the game. And I have to say that I absolutely I really do see both sides of the argument. I think I'm sitting now somewhat on the fence. I've kind of somewhat shifted, and this is what I say all the time, like. People say that people shouldn't flip-flop with their opinions. And I ask the question, why? Why are people not allowed to change their mind, even on a day-by-day basis? I don't know why it frustrates people so much. You get more opinions. You take in more views. You get, you talk to more people. You listen to more takes. And your view can change, you know? And your view should change when you listen to more people. And I think that absolutely, well, yesterday I was saying, absolutely. And I said after, in the immediate aftermath of the game, I was like, no, Saka, not a penalty. Categorically, never, ever a penalty for me. I think he initiates the contact. Well, by the morning, I'd reflected on it a bit more. and I see more of the argument that it could have been a penalty. I still think I lean slightly more towards it not being a pen for the reasons I outlined yesterday. But it is, my view is certainly open to shifting based upon the arguments that are put forward. And I think there's really good points of view on the penalty and, of course, the Gabrielle situation on both sides. I think there's really good arguments for both. So, yeah, don't be annoyed when people change their minds uh, and, and in a short space of time either because people should be encouraged to have an open mind because what's the point of having one if you're never going to change it? Um, John says, everybody was fortunate. Bayern lucky, Kane wasn't sent off. Bayern lucky, penalty for Saka, Arsenal lucky, Gabriel penalty. Yeah, it was one of those games where there could have been different decisions given for loads of different things on the day. It probably means that a draw is the best result. And not the best result, sorry. A draw is probably the most vin- vindicated result deserving result for both sides. Um, I think that's probably the fairest way to put it. And that a draw is reflective of, of how the game played out. Bayern had chances. We had chances. Um, and uh, ultimately, we, we had three big ones. We took two of them and Ben White missed the third one. They had three big chances. They took two of them and Coman hit the post with the other one. So, you know, I, I think it's probably a fair result, you know, in the end, to be fair. And uh, we go to Bayern, I think, with a great opportunity still of, of winning that game. They're going to be missing a couple of players. We obviously didn't see Rice or Havertz get suspended. We might make some changes. I think Jesus has got a good shout of starting this game. I think Tommy Asu has got a good shout. I think Partey's potentially got a good shout to start this game. It's going to be a very different environment. It's in a hostile away arena. But we have dealt with these in the past. You know, we've gone to Man City. We've gone to Liverpool and not lost. You know, we've gone to places that are really hard to go to and won very comfortably, like Brighton, not so recently. A really good environment. Played really well. You go to places like West Ham, a place where we've not done well at in the past. One six nil. You know we can go to these grounds and play well and score goals. I know they're not at the level of Bayern Munich, of course, but in terms of the environment, this is a much more experienced team. And I think this Champions League experience is doing, you know, some really good things. And I was talking to uh, a number of commenters yesterday on yesterday's video that were maybe a little bit more down on the performance, and they were like, you know, we're not favourites to go through, you know, Arteta and kind of pointing the finger at Arteta a bit, saying this is an underachievement because Bayern are probably the worst Bayern side that we've seen in recent years. And that's absolutely fine. They might be one of the worst Bayern sides that we've seen in recent years. doesn't mean they're still not good. You know, it's <laughs> it doesn't mean they're still not a great team. You know, a, a, the, the, a Rolex with a scratch in it is still a Rolex, you know? <laughs> so if you want to try and put it that way, you're still going to get a fair whack for it if you sell it. But when it comes to... Arsenal's opportunity is our best opportunity and I will be disappointed if we don't go through in this fixture you know but for Arsenal not to win the Champions League at their first time of asking under Arteta is hardly something to moan about we've reached the quarterfinals with the first time we've done it in 14 years and anything we get past this point you know shows some real impressive progression and is something of a of something to look at as, you know, another really positive step in the right direction under this manager. Uh, Gage says, why does it seem Trossard is so much more impactful as a sub when he starts? He just doesn't seem the same. Now, I want to address this, right? Because for me, this whole Trossard as a sub is just, it, it's true that he is a good impact substitute. You know, I don't want to say that for a minute. He is not um, a bad substitute at all. He's very good. But this suggestion of when he starts, he just doesn't seem the same. I kind of want to just quash this. Are there performances where when Trossard has started, he's not necessarily done, you know, as good as he's done in some of his substitute performances? And the answer to that question is, yes, in some games that he started, he has not been particularly that great. But can I just point out, and also in the Champions League, PSV starting at home, goal, assist. Sevilla starting, goal in the 2-0 win. 
Um, Porto starts the game, scores an incredibly important goal in the Champions League, you know? Um, Burnley at home this season when we won 3-1, started, scored, got an assist in that game. Crystal Palace scored in that 5-0 win, starting that game as well. Started against Burnley, scored, started against West Ham, scored. Uh, and if we go back to last season as well, when he was playing a significant number of games, he started that Fulham game in which we got three assists with him starting the game as well. Let's not forget that. He started the game, uh, he started the game against... Uh, buh, 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 buh. Uh, Leicester City got an assist started the game against Everton got an assist started the game against Fulham as I said got three assists started the game against Palace got an assist started the game against Leeds played on the right wing got an assist we won all those games by the way um, started the final game of the season against Wolves got two assists you know so this argument that Trossard isn't good as a starter is wrong category I hate absolutes I really do when people say things like yesterday Yaku Kivior can't play against good teams um, Leandro Trossard's not good when he starts games. It's really frustrating. Is there an argument that in some games Trossard has started this season, he hasn't been showing his, his best for? Absolutely there is. Yes, you can definitely argue that in some games this season when Trossard has started, he's not necessarily shown his best form, right? But let's not forget that it's, it's not exactly like it, it's a given that whenever he comes on as a sub, he is also great. You know, it's not necessarily when he comes on off the bench that he gives you something different. He came on in the away game against Newcastle that we lost 1-0. Didn't offer us really anything in that game when he came off the bench, you know. And we haven't lost too many games this season. He came off the bench against Aston Villa when we lost. Did he change the game? I mean, I think he was putting some better deliveries into the box, but nothing that actually changed the end result of the game. So I think we need to kind of get our mind out of this mindset of absolutes and saying this is how it works and this is a different way and if he starts games he's not going to do well and if he comes off the bench he is going to do well it's not like that and that's why I think there is a really good argument actually that Trossard should start in Bayern Munich because I think his experience will be important I think they're going to put Kimmich at right back again and he had better opportunities you know why he scored you know why he was actually in a position to score against Bayern? If you watch the replay of our second goal where Trossard scores, he actually starts off playing further right than the centre line of the pitch would be. If you were to put a line all the way through the middle of the pitch uh, lengthways, he starts off to the right of it, moves into the middle and then receives the pass from Gabriel Jesus. Martinelli can drift, but is much more inclined to be much more of a kind of out wide in those areas and will try and take his man on. Trossard's got greater movement. He likes to come inside, not just with the ball, but also, of course, just with his movement off the ball as well. There's a good argument that he should start. And I think there's also the, the fact that Martinelli can have an impact off the bench against the tired back line. Martinelli's got that speed, that pace to get in behind. Why not bring him off the bench against a more, you know, tired Kimmich rather than a player that's had the opportunity to start against Martinelli all game? So I think there is something to be said about this whole Trossard thing. I might do a piece on it a little bit later on this afternoon as well to get my point in words. But I, I just think this whole thing about Trossard is, is a big misconception. And I think there's a lot of you know arguments that actually know the guy can start games and has started games and been really effective. I know I went off on a bit of a tangent, a bit of a long one there, but it is a point that I've got very frustrated about talking about. Uh, Malvin says, on the volley, uh, in response to something that on the volley said, uh, I, oh, here we go. I'll do the question first. I have a question. Why is it that when a player gets criticised, it's always, I don't get the hate, blah, 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 but why can't there be constructive criticism without the meltdown player needs to adapt and learn? On the volley, you're so spot on with this. So spot on. If a player gets hate, right? It's it's one thing. If a player gets constructive criticism, it's completely different. So I'll give you a really good example. Um, I had someone message me yesterday and was kind of a, a back and forth talking about Kivior. And they said that Kivior showed a lack of uh, experience in yesterday's game and didn't adapt well to the way that Leroy Sané was playing against him. He was able to roll off him. He didn't like give him an extra yard. He was kind of maybe too aggressive in going up to him and got rolled very easily. And I was like, you're spot on. It was really quite naive in some of the moments that he played in in, in that game. And uh, that's an element of his game as still a, a relatively young defender that he needs to improve. And to be fair, as we have talked about, he is a centre-half playing left-back. And so there is going to be maybe a reason behind that. Constructive criticism. On the other hand, we had a comment, as you know, that we highlighted yesterday. Jakob Kivior is trash against any good team. So that's a criticism. 
But it's also ridiculous because, as we've talked about, came on against Liverpool at 1-1, started the game against Man City, has been starting the majority of our games in 2024 as a left-back when we've been exceptional. You know, this guy's got assists this season, this year, sorry, in, in, in key games. You know, I think he played the ball to Trossard in the Liverpool game. I think he potentially played the ball to, was it Havertz? Um, or was involved in the Havertz build-up game at, in the game against Sheffield United? Like, it's, it's frustrating, isn't it, from my perspective? Because there is a difference between constructive criticism and just hate. And I know that 99% of the people that watch this channel or are involved in this community, 99% of you guys know exactly the difference between the two. You're never going to be able to quell the 1%. They're always going to exist. They're always going to be the 1%. But at the end of the day, constructive criticism, very welcomed. Hate, abuse, and just these absolutes that are silly. Certainly not. Uh, so in response to that, uh, there was a comment from Alvin says, Ondavoli, oh yeah, I'm more than busy searching for a... Oh, so I think this is in actually a response to a different question that Ondavoli may have asked. But on this, uh, I'm more busy searching for a striker who suits the system at Arsenal. Someone different from Jesus. Yes, I've watched him since his transfer rumours started. Trust me, the guy is as good. I wonder who that is in reference to. You'll have to let us know in the chat box a little bit long because I can't seem to find the follow-up... Um, in terms of who that is. Oh, Guyokarez. Oh, Yokarez, best striker for us. Malvin says Yokarez. You know I'm a big fan of Yokarez. I'd love to see him come through at Arsenal. I think it'd be a really good option for us in the summer. Uh, thank you so much, Vijay, for the uh, the very kind donation. Um, Vijay has been one of our uh, longest-term listeners and is a member of the channel as well. So thank you. Um, Vijay says, I suggest all to go and check out Adam Cleary's amazing breakdown on the game on 442. Completely gave me a new perspective of things, and I realized how much Arteta has improved the in-game management. It's actually on my list. I think Clive tweeted it out yesterday. So if you want a quick access to what... Vijay is talking about go to Clive's Twitter. I'm pretty sure he tweeted the 442 video out. So definitely one to, to give a watch. Uh, TB says, hi, Tom. What do you think about Arsenal versus Aston Villa? Which players will be there? And also, do you think that Saka's moment with the penalty was similar to Elliot's moment with the penalty? I, I do see differences between the Elliot and the Saka one. Just briefly, the Elliot incident, I think Wan-Bissaka gives the referee more than enough reason to give it even if Elliot maybe exaggerates the contact, whereas Neuer isn't as obviously in the path of Saka in the same way. Some people will think, what on earth are you talking about, Tom? That's just how I see it. I see that the Wan-Bissaka incident is so much more obvious, like with the sliding challenge, kind of scissor action almost, whereas the Neuer is kind of like he's moving towards Saka and you could argue his outstretched leg is there, but I think that Saka can... I, I personally think that Saka can skip round him. Um, it's just my view, but I think he probably would be better to to, to just avoid the contact with Neuer and and, and shoot and score. Um, that's just my view on the Aston Villa game. Uh, in terms of players that will be there, changes that we might make. I think we might see Tommy Asu come in. There's an opportunity to, to kind of get him started up and warmed up for the game against Bayern. I don't think there's any problem starting him back to back games. Um, you might see Partey come in to give him you know, opportunity to start and then start the game against Bayern as well and then bring on Jorginho later if we're having a good game. We can kind of just hold it out there. So yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about what we might see um, in these games and the changes that we might make. We might see Jesus start. We might see Havertz start. There's a lot of options. Um, but I think we might be, make a couple of changes to the team, a couple of tweaks, and let's see. Uh, Clive says, Kimmich, Tom, you were right. Oh, that's, you know, whenever Clive starts a comment with the words, Tom, you were right. I'm just going to... Um, I'm just going to print screen this for uh, for future use. So just just bear just bear with me a second while I while I print screen that. Um, Tom, you were right. Uh, I'm just going to copy and paste that onto a slide. Lovely stuff. There it is. Thank you, Clive. Uh, Clive says, Tom, you were right. That guy Kimmich at centre mid would be perfect with Rice as a partner, and also could be a six with Havertz if Rice needed a rest. Um, yeah, and I think the thing is that the, the thing about Kimmich is that he's of an elite level now. Yes, the age profile is going to raise a few eyebrows of some Arsenal fans that are insecure about the older generations. You know, I'm just saying, just saying, you've got to give everyone a chance. Um, <laughs> he says, as someone who's really bad and totally for being 28, I know the hypocrisy. Um, but the perspective from Kimmich is like, he is of an elite level that gives you that option for two or three years while we're on the lookout for that midfielder that can come in in 2025 or 2026. And Kimmich can absolutely be an immediate impact option for us in this upcoming window. So yeah, 100% bring him in. And he can be a great depth option at fullback as well, as he's proved again 
uh, on Tuesday night. Uh, Maggie says, I don't really want to keep talking about the Saka penalty, but I wonder if it had been given if it happened in the 60th minute rather than at the end of the game. I see what you're saying. So you're saying if that same incident happens 30 minutes earlier, is the referee more inclined to give the penalty? It's impossible to know the answer, of course. Um, but I absolutely understand, Matt, why you're asking the question. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for the kind donation. Again, Mike, another one of our very, very dedicated listeners who is listening uh, always to our evening shows and commits and, and joins us for our evening shows at a ridiculous time in the morning over there in Australia. Mike says, is the Trossard and others debate not created by our historical obsession with starting 11s? What is important, surely, is the full squad, uh, use, uh, use of it and the adaption uh, of playing. To be honest, we did well with Bayern. Yeah, I, I saw people saying Arteta got it wrong. I like got the lineup wrong for the game. I, I don't think so. I think Arteta chose the team that most of us chose. I think that actually Bayern surprised us, surprised perhaps Arteta, surprised everybody with how they approached the game in, in a very respect. Bayern Munich respected Arsenal. Like It wasn't a game where we've seen time after time where they don't respect Arsenal and they just do whatever because they know they can batter us. It was a game in which Bayern respected us. And they respected us by playing a style based around how Arsenal play. And we didn't adapt to it early enough in terms of the players that started the game. But Arteta adapted to it at halftime with the Zinchenko sub and later on with the Partey and the Jesus subs, which obviously got us back into the game. Some people said that we, we didn't make those subs early enough in terms of Jesus and Partey. What I would say is that I don't necessarily think I'm going to, you know, uh, be too grouchy about the subs not being five or ten minutes earlier. I think they were fine to be made, and the fact is that they were made, and that he made an impact. And ultimately, we could have we could have won the game in the end, maybe if a different decision is made with the penalty. Who knows? Um, but equally, it could have been lost as well with Coman's chance. So you never know what's going to happen in the end. I think the changes that were made were were very important. Uh, Clive says Kimmick doesn't want to play fullback, and it's a bone of contention with with Tuchel. Um, indeed, the majority of his games in the last two to three years have been played in midfield. He was kind of seen as a, a Philip Lahm regen, if you like. And of course, the irony about Philip Lahm is that predominantly he played at right back. But when Pep Guardiola arrived at Bayern Munich, Lahm suddenly became this brilliant centre midfielder um, and something of a new generation of, of midfielder that inspired so many more midfielders of his like in in the future and Kimmich certainly was um was was such a kind of a regen of it was so strange that Kimmich it was so alike to Philip Lahm um and I'm you're right Clive he absolutely would rather be playing in midfield uh Malman says do you think Newcastle's FFP situation could give us advantages to sign players from their side if so is the idea of bringing Sandro Tonali's Ban. Uh, is this not the time instead of going for Isaac? Um, I mean, the, the Sandra Tonali's ban, I mean, um, is that in, in any way affecting it? I guess it's another player that they've invested a lot of in that they can't use. There's a lot made of this FFP stuff. What I would say is David Ornstein did say, uh, I think last week, that they aren't expecting Isaac to leave, even with this PSR stuff going on. Uh, Philip says, same, uh, the Sane penalty was more dramatic from less contact. Throws himself in the arm, stretched upwards, not natural. And when you're tripped and fall down, dramatic for the ref, even though not needed. I think Saka was pretty dramatic in the way that he went down, to be fair. <laughs> I don't think we can critique his, his uh, theatrics of going down. I think he tried to buy it as much as he could, but... Um, one was given, one wasn't. I, I don't necessarily think there's as much in the whole thing about Sane initiating contact with Saliba. I, I do think it is a penalty. Um, I think there is more of an argument the Sane one is a penalty than the Saka one. But I absolutely understand why people have got these bones of contentions with, with both decisions. Uh, Fuad says, I feel when it comes to having a great defence, it's more secondary with comparisons to the Premier League. The Champions League is won by attacking game changers, in my opinion, which is why I'd like us to concentrate there in the summer. And it's a really good point. You know, the Champions League is definitely a different beast to the Premier League in terms of approach to games. Um, it's, you know, we, people rave about Diego Simeone. Uh, they rave about his record. I mean, he hasn't lost, I don't think a Champions League game at home, or no, sorry, a Champions League knockout game at home in his entire career, which is an incredible record. And he's reached, I think, what, two Champions League finals with that. But the problem is, is that, the, the system is so, in some ways flawed because he's never won the competition with Atletico. He's obviously lost a final twice with Atletico. Um, and sadly, he's been unable to achieve that ultimate goal. 
And he's only won one trophy in like the last, what is it? I think it's a longer period of time than Arteta's won a trophy. So it's a great record, but the Champions League, ultimately, whilst you do need good defensive abilities, you do need that defensive structure, it is an attacking tournament. And that's why you're seeing Man City score goals, Bayern score goals, us score goals, PSG score goals, Barcelona score goals. Like, you know, we're reaching these final stages. In the final, um, there was 18 goals across four games in the quarterfinals. And that tells you everything you need to know about the Champions League. Uh, Kyle says, right now, the focus should be Aston Villa, play the strongest 11 in that game and think about Bayern after that. No need to rotate. It's a really good point. You know, is there any need for Arsenal not to go full strength against Villa? We arguably probably should go full strength against Villa because the Premier League is as, if not maybe more important than the Champions League. So we're top of that. You know, if we win every game, we win the league. So we've got to focus on winning every single game. So yes, if we can go as strong as possible, we can. But I do think there is some arguments that you can still start some players and you're still going really, really strong and still thinking about the game ahead as well. Uh, Gage says, when we beat Bayern, fingers crossed, would you rather play City or Madrid? I'd rather have Madrid uh, just because I, I think that the Man City game suits Liverpool more in the title race. I think there's more implications for the title race if we face Man City as opposed to the um as opposed to facing real madrid so then there's more of a mental side um so there you go uh, kingsley says your non biased hat is still too big you need to fully accept that saka's one was a penalty just as the gabriel one could have been as well i don't know what the bias is what's am i being hold on so let me get this straight kingsley can i please do send another reply are you criticizing me for being too unbiased <laughs> and you're saying i should be more biased is that what you're saying because if so and i say this with love and respect that's the most ridiculous thing i've ever heard <laughs> imagine criticizing someone for being not biased enough <laughs> this mad honestly i, I really thought I, I didn't think it could get as ridiculous as, as that and i want kingsley to clarify this but it does seem like you're criticizing me for not being biased enough, which I think is might be the most 2024 thing I've ever seen, if that is the case. Uh, FC Till I Die says, sorry, more penalty talk. Uh, my view, <laughs> we can't escape this, can we? Uh, my view on the penalty is I don't think Saka could have gone round at the pace that he was going at. Also, he had played 90 minutes plus and was fatigued. I, I you know, I again, I, I see the argument. I see it. I just think I've seen players in that situation not, Take, not take the fall and I think I've seen players in that same situation you know get past the goalkeeper um Kingsley says it was tongue-in-cheek okay okay that's fine I, you never know these days Kingsley to be fair I hold my hands up to you and apologize you never know I, I never can tell because the amount of ridiculous takes I see on this app on Twitter and everywhere you never know whether to take people at face value or not these days. Uh, Tizer says, uh, Tom, do you have any worries about Arsenal playing last weekend and the pressure being put on the squad like last year? Um, oh, sorry, about playing last this weekend. Do I have any qualms about that? Uh, we've played last a lot and won. We've played first a lot and won. So I'm going to go with Mikel Arteta's answer. I think he was asked a similar question in a recent press conference and say, no, uh, I'm I'm not worried about it because we've we've done both and won, we've done both and lost. So I don't necessarily think that it's it's a thing. So there you go. Um, Jack says, "How are you? I'm good, mate. Thank you for asking. Appreciate it." Um, Jay says, "Been that sounded really aggressive. Appreciate it." <laughs> Genuinely, Jack, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Jay says, been following Virginia for a while. Uh, he was impressive last night. I think he would be a great fit for the Arsenal. What are your thoughts? Um, Virginia, of course, used to be a Wolves. It's quite the, the pathway Virginia has had. He's a talented midfielder. Is it the style of midfielder we're looking for? I'm not sure. Um, I think maybe we need something more of a, a bit more of a workhorse in midfield to come in, um, which is why Gerard Gomez, I think, is maybe being talked about. Um, Kimmich, of course, again, another one that's being talked about a lot. Um, is Vitinha the type? I think maybe there's too much. And I, I know it might be a lazy comparison because they're both Portuguese. I don't know if there's maybe something of the, the Vieira lightweightedness um, that, that he gets kind of attached to that that, that kind of uh, that label. It's lazy, I agree. But 
you know, maybe there's just, maybe we need something a bit more of a, a physicality side of things for our midfield. Uh, Aaron says, Tom, if they watched all Saka cut videos, uh, you will see how he jumps to avoid tackling from opponents. Does he tend to stretch his right leg out as well a little bit? Does he exaggerate the right leg swinging out as well like he did against Neuer? I'd be curious. Uh, Derek says, Tom, you expect many changes for Sunday? Potentially a banana skin seeing what happened this week. Also on Saka, uh, got the same tackle at Anfield and he stayed up. Oh, interesting. Interesting point. Um, do I expect many changes for Sunday? Probably not loads. No, I think we'll go still relatively strong. I think maybe the left back might change. Um, but other than that, Maybe Jesus will come in. Maybe Partel will come in. Let's wait and see. Um, TB says, which out of the two teams of Real Madrid do you want to see? Oh, we've already kind of done that. I said I'd rather have Real Madrid. The uh, effects of Man City, I think, are, are too bad to choose them. Uh, there are, by the way, over 1,200 of you watching both across YouTube and Twitter. If you're watching on Twitter, make sure you hop over to YouTube and help us out over here because um, you can join and ask questions in the chat box. But uh, thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Do drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you're new around here with those notifications turned on so you never miss a show. I'll be back with you, of course, tomorrow morning, bright and early once again at 8am to give you all the latest roundup of the latest Arsenal news and views. And I look forward um, to, to speaking with you, hopefully about some more positive news going into this game at the weekend against Aston Villa. Tomorrow is Friday which means, of course, we're going to have a preview show, hopefully, for you as well. But not only was today a great day because it's, you know, it's Thursday. I like Thursdays. It means you've got one more day to look ahead to a Friday. But today is Fallout Day. I'm very much looking forward to watching Fallout this evening with the misses and looking forward to finishing that series and probably binging it. Probably going to binge a lot of it, to be fair. But uh, but work comes first. Do look out for the piece I'm probably going to end up writing about. Um, Leander Tross. I'm also planning on writing a piece about Saka and the abuse that he continues to receive. I'm thinking about doing one and kind of why Saka gets kind of more of this increased abuse than other players. Um, so yeah, look out for those pieces coming out a little bit later on today on football.london. Um, but thank you so much for listening. Uh, do drop a like before you go. Help us to 1K every single day. And as always, up the Arsenal.